like the rose trampled on the ground. Have you ever thought about how many of the people that our Lord ministered to and healed and lifted in the gospel stories are actually people who are like a rose trampled on the ground. They were generally not people who had the power and the authority. In fact, it could be pretty rough on them. They were the people who were the outcasts in society. I, 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 I think that if he, he were ministering today, of course he ministers to everybody, but, but those would be people that he would, would have a special interest in if he were still walking this earth and we might be surprised if uh, we were lined up with uh, uh, a group of folks and uh, we were dressed nice and looking okay and there were others there who were disheveled and broken and uh, it might be those folks that he would go to first Think of people in society today who are pushed back, who are out of it, who are rejected, and always, always they are somehow considered to be uh, to be uh, sinful as well as broken. We we tend to have those two things together in mind. And that's true of the woman I'm about to read you about today. We're going to read about two people. Actually, the the, the story today is one of those masterpieces from the gospel. It's about the woman who touches the hem of Jesus' garment, but it's not just about her. It's also about Jairus, who was a very prominent and important man. So you've got both of these people in this, in this same story. This is also an unusual gospel story because it's, it's the only one in the gospels, I believe, that has a story within a story. And that's very significant in this, in this narrative. First of all, it's a, it's a great uh, uh, narrative device for building suspense, but it's part of what this whole story is about. It's the story within the story. Let, let me share this much with you. Now, when Jesus returned, the crowd welcomed him, for they were all waiting for him. And just then there came a man named uh, Jairus, a leader of the synagogue, and he fell at Jesus' feet and begged him to come to his house, for he had an only daughter, about 12 years old, who was dying. And Jesus went, and the crowds passed, uh, pressed in on him. So you have this whole bunch of people moving along. This is, uh, this is an emergency run. Uh, this is where in our day the ambulances are called out and uh, they don't stop at the stoplights and they, you have to get out of the way and you hear them blaring and people are trying to pull over to the side. This is an instance where the girl is not just sick, she's dying and Jesus has to get there quickly and nothing needs to stop him and it's interesting that something's about to stop the whole procession he is now we would say that what the woman does stops the procession but no actually Jesus stops the whole procession himself and we might think needlessly but he doesn't think so now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years, bleeding. And though she had spent all she had on physicians, no one could cure her. I sympathize with that woman. Not that it's cost a lot of money, but I've been to the doctor two or three times. and. Uh, the first shot he gave me, he said, uh, it'll be gone tomorrow. Uh, that was three, three weeks ago. But now you can have gout, you're still not an outcast, okay? Uh, but what she had, uh, I, there, there's a lot of Old Testament scripture uh, about women and any, any kind of, uh, of, uh, uh, of, of uh, ambitions or anything associated with women. I read a story the other day, and I probably shouldn't tell it, but it's, there was a man who wanted to live for one year, going to write a book. He was going to live for one year uh, like a Jewish man in the Old Testament times. And uh, at that time, a woman who had her uh, monthly 
uh, was considered uh, un unclean and, and nobody could, could be around her and they weren't supposed to sit where she could sit. Well, his, his wife just got exasperated with this whole project of his and uh, she went and sat on everything in the house. <laughs> the beds, chairs, stools, everything. <laughs> he had to sleep in the, in the car that night. <laughs> That's the only place he had to go to. The Old Testament was pretty well rough on women. I'm going to read you a, a, a scripture in a, in a couple of weeks about a, a woman who was thought possibly to have had a, a, a adultery. And we're going to compare it with the way Jesus worked with those things. The, the, women had it rough anyway. And this woman was, was condemned. She was socially, it was like, it was like having leprosy. And nobody could be around her. She couldn't touch anybody. Nobody could touch her. Picture a woman uh, in this solitary life and uh, with no one able to do anything about it. And uh, she had it in her mind that this man, Jesus, could, but she was in a catch-22. For him to heal her, she believed, he needed to touch her or she needed to touch him but he was by scripture forbidden to do that now she didn't know how often he was willing to ignore and set aside Old Testament law if it interfered with his ministry of grace I want us to be aware of that for those in Old Testament times, for the ancient Hebrew, and, and though all of those to whom Jesus was ministering now, the law was supreme. It came before any individual needs. For Jesus, people were supreme. They came before any commandment that might stand in the way of their getting what they needed. Our Lord always asked, what does this person need? Whoever they might be, however sinful they might be, his question was and is today, what does this person need? And I think that's God's question about us now and forever. What do we need? There's a line I like to use, and I've used it often enough. Hope you memorized it. God will never do anything to us, for us, or with us that is not for our benefit. Let's move on. She could not touch him. She did not believe that he would touch her. There's a great crowd pushing around Jesus. She came up behind him and touched the fringe of his clothing, and immediately her hemorrhaging stopped. Then, then Jesus, on this emergency run, stopped right where he is and he asked who touched me when all denied it Peter said I love this line from Peter and it's a it's a logical thing for him to say he said listen master uh, look at all these people around you they're all pushing and shoving everybody's touching you a lot of people are touching you why do you ask who touched me it could be any of these people a lot of people touching you but Jesus said, someone touched me, for I noticed that power had gone out from me. Now this is what you call a transaction, all right? Something has happened. It's a real thing. It's my idea that every time we pray to God, there is a transaction. We cannot see what happens on the other side, but it is always a transaction. We do something and God is hearing and God will do, may not, perhaps not what we ask, but there is always a transaction. Prayer is a transaction. Life is, life is, let me see what life is. Oh, forgot my own phrase. Life is a cooperative Venture with God. I, 
genuinely don't have time to tell this, but I'm going to tell it anyway. I know I tell you that all the time, but it, I, have to, I have to say it. Um, this, this is something I, I, I used in, 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 uh, in, in, in that book, which has never been published. By the way, uh, in the morning, I'm going to push a button on my computer. And when I push that button, that first book, which is the Columns book, is going to go off to the publisher, and it's going to be out of my hands. And in six weeks, it's going to be an actual book that you can hold in your hands. I've talked about th these books for so, so many years. I don't know what's going to actually happen when there is actually a book. Now, it's not, 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 the, not, not the book, not, not, uh, not the book I've talked about the most, but it's that Columns book, which has been as hard to get together as the other one, actually, uh, it, 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 it seems to me. Well, anyway, uh, this, this is a story I, t I tell in there. There was a woman named Pam Reynolds who uh, uh, had a brain aneurysm, and they were going to have to do surgery. And uh, she, uh, they could not operate uh, under normal processes, so they had to put her out, and I mean they had to put her completely out. Uh, they had to uh, lower her body temperature, uh, get all the blood uh, out of the brain area, and stop the heart. Now what do you call some person in that condition? Yeah, <laughs> I'd call them dead. When you stop the heart, you're dead. Now, what's going to happen to Pam though? because she is living in an alien environment. She's here in a body which is essentially dead. Well, she watches the whole surgery from outside of it. She can, she can describe the whole surgery and all the instruments that are used later. But what I find fascinating is she ends up going through this tunnel. She said it's like a tornado vortex from the Wizard of Oz, you know, the spinning thing, you know, and there she went. And she said at the end of the tunnel, she was met by her whole family that had passed before. And she names off the family. It included her grandmother and her uncle and her, uh, and her great aunt, who was really not a great aunt, but they treated her like it and all that kind of... This whole bunch of family met her. And uh, Pam could see this glorious, glorious light. And she said all she wanted to do was go to that light. And the family held her there, would not let her move until the surgery was over. And when the surgery was over, uh, they were in a kind of discussion about who would take her back through the tunnel, and her grandmother kind of said she didn't want to. Uh, the, I, I don't know, and her uncle volunteered. Okay, somebody had to do it. So uh, the uncle took her back through the tunnel. Pam did not look at her body on that thing, it looked dead. They had shaved half of her head. She said it was horrible looking. She didn't want to go. The uncle said she had to. She said no. He shoved her. She said it was like being shoved into a vat of ice water. And she said then all was blackness and, and after that she doesn't remember anything until she came through the street. But what I find interesting about that, I said God, life is a cooperative victim venture with God. That surgery, the doctors after it was over said, well, we did it. Okay. We saved her life. We did the end. But they didn't do it by themselves. If heaven had not participated in that, the woman would not have survived. She would have died. Her desire was to go on and be with God. Heaven did that. Heaven has an interest in, in our lives. This woman was smart enough to know that Jesus had the power to make a difference in her life and she was going to pull this power into her life. And for you and me, it's easier, it's easier than you might think. I, I want us to keep Pam Reynolds in mind because I want us to remember that every day is like this. We don't know what God is doing in our lives, but I can promise you in the name of Jesus Christ, that every day God is doing, God is doing deliberately and lovingly in our lives. And God is working. And there is no reason in the world for us to ever get discouraged about anything as long as God is loving us and God will love us forever. Now, this is as far as I'm going to be able to go on the scripture. We're going to cut it right here and we're going to come back to it next week because the heart of our service is still to come. What the woman found out is that Jesus, who does lay her hands on her and tells her that she has been healed by, by
by her trust in him. What he tells us in this bread is that I am giving myself to you. I'm giving myself to you. I'm, become, I'm going to become that rose trampled in the dirt. I am going to become the one who lays down his life for you. And this kind of love for us from God does not need to be ignored by you and me. We don't need to go on as though God does not love us because that is the central truth of our lives. In him we live and move our being and have our being. All of our life is in relationship to God. Let's remember it and live it that way. Join me in prayer. Dear God of grace and glory, we are before you now as this woman in need who touched the hem of your garment, but we know that we can come before you and we can take you by the hand. We can, we can look our Lord in the face. We can know his grace and feel his goodness and receive his love for us. And we are before you now and we are asking you to look at the places in our lives, dear Lord, where we need your love the most and we open our hearts to that. Any of us here who have had discouragement or are uh, feeling lately that uh, they're not going to make it, encourage them by your grace and lift them. For we cannot lose for winning because of Christ our Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.